Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy, and this is your word at the middle of the week, coming to you from Zion Lutheran Church in Wausau, Wisconsin. Today is Wednesday, March 29th, and we pray blessings upon Zion and upon Bethany, whom we also serve, and of course also on Peace Lutheran Church in Edgar, with whom we've been working a little bit these past few weeks, uh, and their pastor, Robert Worthington. And blessings upon Chris Johnson, my associate here, and uh, Pastor Pinzel, our retired pastors. Pastor Pinzel serving in Lejeune uh, as a military chaplain, and our retired pastors, Pastor Gulhag and Pastor Reif. Uh, we're very blessed to have folks, to know folks who are laboring in the gospel of the Lord. And of course, blessings to all of you who listen this day. So, we are talking about the Holy Trinity. Today will be our very last and final um study on the Holy Trinity. And I thought one topic that we don't often cover in the church is how to um, really welcome and embrace the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, uh, which is to say the, the reality of the Holy Trinity uh, in our daily devotion. So we talk about, you know, the Holy Trinity means that God is one God and three persons, that God um, is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is equal in majesty, uh, and yet there's an order to them. You know, the, the Father loves the Son, the Father sends the Son, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. Um, and so how does that doctrine actually become something that shapes our faith, that shapes our love and worship of God? So we'll talk about that from a couple of different perspectives. The first way we're going to talk about it is to simply talk about prayer. And for that, we're going to begin with the, cat the catechism. Lutheran Church has a catechism. It's called the Small Catechism. A little history on the Small Catechism. Uh, the Small Catechism is made up of six sections. Uh, the Well, more than that, actually, but six sort of chief articles of the faith. So we have uh, the... First one is the Ten Commandments. The second one is the Apostles' Creed. The third is the Lord's Prayer. And then after that, we have the Sacrament of Holy Baptism, Confession, Absolution, and the Sacrament of Holy Communion. We also have, at the back of the Catechism, two additional sections, one on daily prayers and one on the table we call the daily or the table of duties, which is simply a description of how Christians are to understand themselves in various vocations within the world. Sometimes those two additional uh, sections are not given a lot of attention. And people think, well, you know, how important are they? Uh, we have to really get the doctrine across. But Martin Luther himself thought that especially the daily prayers were extremely important. They were the first section of the small catechism to be published. And they, in fact, were once omitted from a publication, and he republished it in order to make sure that they were added. So the daily prayers were very, very important. However, uh, why do we have this catechism? <clears throat> Excuse me, where does it come from? So by the time Martin Luther was born in 1486, I believe, um, the medieval Western church had developed a catechism that included always the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. Those were sort of the three chief parts of the catechism. And every catechism of the church included those parts. Now, they also added other things that Luther left out, like prayers to the Virgin Mary, for example. But he added things that the other catechisms, the earlier catechisms did not have, um, the sacraments, confession and absolution, table of duties, and and the version of daily prayers that we have from him. So he had all of this published uh, for the sake of the church's health and well-being in the late 1520s, after he had done a tour of Germany and found that people did not know the basic doctrines of the church. That's what the small catechism is. It's a compendium of the basic doctrines of the church, simply stated in a way that a parent can teach a child or um, spouses can teach one another, or friends can share with one another. It's a home book of faith. And that's why we're beginning there to talk about daily devotion, because 
as a home book of faith. It has those daily prayers that were so important to Luther that he even republished the small catechism when a version without it was published first. Um, and they were the first section of the, the catechism to be published uh, in January of, I believe, 1526, maybe 27. I think it's 1526. So uh, let's look at that because they have a very simple way that we can embrace and sort of <clears throat> center ourselves on the Holy Trinity, our blessed God, who is one God in three persons. <clears throat> so we come to the daily prayers, and it says, morning prayer. This is what Luther writes. In the morning, when you get up, make the sign of the Holy Cross and say, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then, kneeling or standing, repeat the creed and the Lord's Prayer. If you choose, you may also say this little prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Then go joyfully to your work, singing a hymn like that of the Ten Commandments, or whatever your devotion may suggest. So that little morning devotion that Luther commends to us is Trinitarian from start to finish. And it really shapes us in the life of the Trinity. So how does it begin? In the morning, when you wake up, before you get out of bed, before you have breakfast, before you brush your teeth, certainly before you grab your phone and check the news of the day, or see who texted you after you went to bed, or something like that. Uh, first thing you do when you wake up is you cross yourself and you say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. What that does from the beginning is it roots you in the name put on you at Holy Baptism. It roots you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or you might say it wraps you up in that name. Now, of course, Holy Baptism is where you're wrapped up in that name. You're wrapped up in that fellowship. But it becomes a daily opportunity to recall that gift and to remember that you have been welcomed into the fellowship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It also confesses who this Son is and the means by which you have been welcomed into that fellowship because you make the sign of the Holy Cross. People sometimes associate that only with Roman Catholicism. Luther would not have understood that. Luther always made the sign of the Holy Cross. He taught people to make the sign of the Holy Cross. Lutherans made the sign of the Holy Cross until they um, sort of journeyed through a couple centuries of history and people became critical of the practice uh, for a variety of reasons. And so then sometimes Lutherans became a little shy about it. But but it is a Lutheran practice. We've inherited it and brought it forward from the larger Western church of which we are a continuing uh, representative branch. And so he teaches us to make that sign and in so doing, it confesses who the Son is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, see? And so who is a Son? He is the one who was crucified for us. And not only crucified for us on the cross, but then he is also the one with whom we have died, with whom we have been crucified through holy baptism into his death, as we say in Romans chapter 6. So what you're really doing when you do that in the morning is you're not only remembering your baptism in some sort of, you know, pure mimetic way, some pure sort of just mental exercise, but you're actually proclaiming to yourself from the outset the narrative of history to which you belong. You belong to that narrative of history that confesses that creation began when the Father made all things for his Son in the power of the Spirit, that you belong to <clears throat> the stream of history in which the Father sent his Son to redeem us and die for us. And now we have been joined to him through the ministry of the church. That is the gift of God's word and sacraments, which create faith. And by that faith, we are united with Jesus Christ now and forever. What a way to begin the day. What a way to begin by acknowledging and praising um, 
the name we've been given and sort of enshrining it in our hearts. So it's not just sort of a doctrine we use to fence certain other doctrines. It's actually part of our prayer. And it's a prayer that gathers up our whole self and says, I belong to this God. And God, you belong to me. And now I welcome you this day into my heart and even upon my flesh. Now, people sometimes ask, how do we make the sign of the Holy Cross, Pastor? That's something I haven't done. My parents didn't teach me to do it. Um, I feel kind of strange doing it until I know how to do it right. Well, this is one of those things not to stress over. And at the same time, it's good to know how to do it well. I mean, anything worth doing is worth doing well. So what you do is, and this is also kind of a fun Trinitarian thing, and there's different, you know, sort of things you can do. But what I've learned, what I've been told, is you take your three fingers, you press them to your thumb, right? So you have the, the three God, the three persons of God and the unity of God right there in your, in your hand. And you begin at the forehead, and you trace it down to your chest, and then you go back to your right shoulder and over to your left shoulder. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's using your right hand. Why do it that way? Well, because in holy baptism, the pastor traces a cross over you when you're baptized. And he traces the cross over you from your forehead to your chest, from your right shoulder to your left shoulder. Uh, not that there's anything magic about it, but we just sort of do things in a uniform fashion precisely so that there's no question about it. And we can just sort of get on with things and not debate it. Well, then why not trace that specific cross made on you at baptism? when you make the sign of the Holy Cross. Now, maybe you weren't baptized that way. Maybe that sign wasn't made over you. Nevertheless, you are sort of confessing your unity and your fellowship with all those who have been thus baptized, right? And you're simply saying, I'm part of this, this whole universal church of which we um, have been made members through Christ. And then what does he have you do? After we welcome the name, after we love the name, after we confess that the name has been put on us and we belong to God and he belongs to us and we're standing within that narrative of the Holy Trinity's life and work, then he has us confess the creed and pray the Lord's Prayer. Now, sometimes people don't like this uh, aspect of the devotion. That was something really surprising to me when I did some work on this for my doctoral research how people did devotion, how people reacted to these daily prayers in the small catechism. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of people said, well, that's, that's church talk, and I don't pray that way in my daily life. I pray in a more casual way to God, and it just seems so formal to be reciting these things that we recite also in church. Well, it's important and valuable. It's valuable to break down in our heads that strong dividing line between my personal devotion and formal church. I mean, why should there be that dividing line? Why should we not love and cherish the forms given to us in church um, and, and, not, and enter into that worship with all the same warmth and devotion with which we pray our personal prayers? See, there's a temptation in, in maintaining that distinction to sort of privilege the self uh, to sort of privilege um, our personal creations of prayer or what happens to us in the privacy of our home over what the Lord has given us in church. And why would we do that? Why would we welcome both with equal fervor and appreciation? You know, in church also, we have room for personal prayer. Uh, in church, people will kneel after Holy Communion, or they'll pray as they come to Holy Communion, or they pray before worship, they pray during worship, um, even saying Amen during worship, adding your Amen to the prayers is a form of personal devotion. So we have room for personal devotion in the formal worship of the church. Why not welcome the forms of the church into your personal devotion? Because specifically what the creed does is it then gives you a little mini sermon to start the day. And a, a mini-sermon you can trust. A mini-sermon that from the beginning says what has proven to be trustworthy and true over the ages, having been well-worn with usage, this Apostles' Creed. Again, that's the creed confessed at Holy Baptism. So it's all flowing from baptism, the font of our life. And what does the creed confess? It confesses the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it roots us within the narrative of creation, redemption, 
and now what we call sanctification as the Holy Spirit works in us the saving benefits of Christ's work of salvation upon the cross and in his resurrection. Um, and so you go, you enter into the day with promises. Notice the Ten Commandments are not spoken first. We'll get to those in a moment. You begin the day with promise. The promise of the name, the promises of the creed, and then the Lord's Prayer, which also is a blessing, because what are you doing in the Lord's Prayer? You are using the very words of the Son to speak to the Father. Now, people may say, where is the Holy Spirit in all of this? We'll get to him in a moment. But just, just let's just pause and say, wow, in the Lord's Prayer, we stand with the Son, united with the Son, in the Son, Jesus Christ, praying to the Father with the very words the Son has given us. Truly, we have been brought into the fellowship, the prayer life, the mind of the Holy Trinity through the Lord's Prayer. And that all happens in the power of the Spirit. This is something made more explicit in what follows, that little prayer that is not really original to Luther. Now, it is and it isn't. Uh, the prayer that he offers us to pray in the morning has its roots long before Luther, at least a thousand years before Luther, in the monastic practices of the church. Those were... There's always a practice, not always, but there developed in the church the practice of praying for the angels to watch over us, uh, giving thanks for the day, confessing our sins, asking God's blessing on the day, and asking for his angels. We find lots of prayers of that nature in the devotional life of the church already by 300 AD. And so uh, in the Desert Fathers and whatnot, in the 4th century, the Desert Fathers were like monks who lived in the desert and prayed to make something more complex, very simple. And this prayer has its roots in that uh, prayer life of the church, specifically a desert father or monk in the desert named Macarius. But anyway, listen again to it and listen how it, to how it is Trinitarian. The Holy Spirit's not mentioned, but knowing what we know about the Holy Spirit, we can hear that he's there. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. That language in there is language of the Spirit, and it's worth pausing and unpacking that. A little bit. Certainly we have the Father. He is the one who's addressed. He is addressed through the Son because we cannot approach the Father apart from the Son, Jesus Christ. And then listen to this language, these verbs, kept, pray, keep, please, commend, be with me, have no power over me. Uh, if we know our catechism, we know that when Martin Luther describes the Holy Spirit, he says the Holy Spirit keeps us with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. The very first thing we pray for is a prayer of thanksgiving. That he has kept us this night from all harm and danger. How does prayer take place? How, do we, how can we say, I pray? Only because the Spirit comes and teaches us how to pray. As Jesus says in the Gospel of John, he will come and teach you all things lead you into all things. But then especially this language, for into your hands I commend myself. Remember that that reflects the language of Jesus when he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Right? And so in being commended to the Father, we're using spirit language. Uh, we're being united with Jesus in commending our spirits into the hands of the Father, which is the work of the Spirit himself. And of course, the Spirit is um, God with us as much as Jesus is God with us. Let your holy angel be with me. So this sense of presence, the Holy Spirit throughout the scriptures is associated with God's presence. His Shekinah in the Old Testament is a term sometimes used there to describe the presence of God associated with his Holy Spirit. That the evil foe may have no power over me. Jesus says specifically to the apostles, in the book of Acts, wait in the city until you receive power from on high. And when does that come? 
when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. Um, and so we're praying for the power of God to be with us in this prayer. We're praying for the Holy Spirit. And that opens up for us then the dynamics of prayer generally. In prayer, we pray to the Father, through the Son, in the power of the Spirit. Prayer is Trinitarian. Prayer is God welcoming us into his own mind and teaching us to be conformed to his mind and to have sort of the, the conversation of the Holy Trinity flow through us. Um, flow to us through the preaching of the word and the teaching of the word and then flow through us back to the Father from which it comes. And then it ends with, uh, go to your work joyfully, singing a hymn of the Ten Commandments. Remember that in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Paul says that we are not to be filled with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. How? by singing hymns, songs, and spirits, hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs. And so singing is associated with the Holy Spirit. We, remember, we see this also in King David. Uh, king David, before he was king, would soothe Saul's uh, distress. King Saul would have evil spirits come upon him. How would those be soothed through the singing and the music of David? And so the Holy Spirit is uh, a singing spirit. He teaches us to sing and specifically the Ten Commandments. These are the way that show us the holy life. And so we enter into our work singing the way of the holy life in the Ten Commandments. A lot of us don't know hymns of the Ten Commandments, you know, so that's kind of hard. But the point is well taken. And it says any hymn that your devotion may suggest. You know, there's no rules here for what you have to sing after you uh, have your morning devotion but something that sort of encourages you and prepares you for daily work is what uh, Luther is suggesting. Well, that's Trinitarian. It begins with the Father. In the name of the Father, it ends with the Spirit singing it's through us, uh, his holiness of life, his sanctification as we go into work. And in the middle, of course, it's the Son from start to finish. As he's proclaimed in the Creed, we pray his prayer and we give thanks to God through him in that little prayer that uh, Luther gives us. So that's one way in which we can welcome the Trinity into our devotion. And the Trinity forms our devotion and our worship. Um, and we can then bring that awareness also when we go to worship, when we go to corporate worship with others. We can say to ourselves, we can remind ourselves, say to ourselves, and just be attentive to the dynamics of what's happening there, that at holy worship itself, what, what's happening is the Holy Spirit is bringing us Jesus. He's bringing us Jesus in his word and in his sacraments, holy communion, holy baptism. He's bringing us Jesus in the proclamation of repentance and forgiveness through the preaching of his law and his gospel. And by bringing the Son to us, the Holy Spirit is uniting us with that Son, keeping us with the Son through faith, so that we may stand before the Father in um, the joy and the liberation of his grace and may know his salvation that he has sent to us in his Son. So it all comes from the Father, leads back to the Father. How does that work? The Spirit brings us the Son. That's what's happening in holy worship. Jesus is being set forth publicly so that all may believe and be united with him and gathered back to the Father. So every service of worship is part of the universal harvest of the church that began <coughs> when Jesus came, lo, these many years ago. A final way, another way, I mean, there's lots of things we could talk about, but one final way uh, to welcome the Trinitarian life into our life is through Trinitarian hymns. And there are some beautiful Trinitarian hymns uh, within our hymnal. We lose, use the Lutheran service book, and it's possible that where you are, you use something different, but you'll find Trinitarian hymns in most Lutheran hymnals. You should be able to find um, some Trinitarian hymns. And so if you open right away to number 504, we come to Father Most Holy. And these hymns have found their way into our hymnals only through Centuries of use in some cases, and certainly some 
some rigorous review um, by leaders of the church. And they put on our lips the doctrine of Holy Trinity in a poetic, beautiful way that helps us to love it more. So 504, Father Most Holy, my uh, allergies are, are acting up here today, so my voice is kind of low and I don't really have um, a singing voice this morning, but I'll just read it to you, all right? Father Most Holy, merciful and tender, Jesus our Savior with the Father reigning. Father Most Holy, merciful and tender, Jesus our Savior with the Father reigning. Spirit of comfort, advocate, defender, light never waning. I mean, that, excuse me, that first stanza really just lays out who the Trinity is. It doesn't even add any verbs between us and the Trinity. It just confesses who he is. First, Father most holy, merciful and tender. This is not the Father in august, um, august condemnation or august critique um, sitting at you, sort of, you know, measuring you up, deciding whether or not he's proud of you. This is Father most holy, merciful, and tender. And then Jesus, the first thing said about him, our Savior, with the Father reigning, so they're put together, kept together, spirit of comfort, because he's often called the comforter, advocate, defender, he's truly a friend as well, light never waning a light that shines perpetually and eternally, therefore an uncreated light, because all the light that we know lasts for a day, lasts for as long as the light bulb lasts, um, lasts for as long as the star lives before it dies. But this light is light never waning. Trinity blessed, unity unshaken, three in one, right there, in the beautiful, poetic, simple statement, Trinity blessed, unity unshaken, Goodness unbounded, very God of heaven, light of the angels, joy of those forsaken, hope of all living. Maker of all things, all thy creatures praise thee. See, the first two stanzas of that hymn, it's really honestly not my favorite hymn. It's the tune I'm, you know, kind of lukewarm about. But the words are just fantastic. The first two stanzas are... Uh, simply confessing the beauty, the goodness, and the truth of the Holy Trinity. And then only in the third stanza do we finally get more here. Maker of all things, all thy creatures praise thee, all for thy worship were and are created. Now as we also worship thee devoutly, hear thou our voices. Only after confessing the Trinity, extolling and praising the Trinity, do we then ask the Trinity for anything. That teaches us about how to welcome the devotion of the Holy Trinity into our life. Praise him. Um, sort of swim in him, if I could may put it that way. Dwell with the Trinity and with the wonder of a being who is infinite in love, eternal in his existence, stretching from before anything existed to after the new creation is fulfilled in his Son, uh, and, uh, you know, unbound goodness, three persons, yet one. This is unlike us. And we say, how can that be? Well, remember, he's not human being like us. He's a God being. God being is different from human being. He is uncreated. And he's welcomed the humanity that he created into his life through the birth, the incarnation, the conception and birth of Jesus um, but that humanity has been welcomed into this eternal fellowship that is omnipresent, that means present everywhere, that is almighty, powerful in every way, uh, that is infinite, unbounded, uh, everlasting, without end. <clears throat> Lord God Almighty, unto thee be glory, one in three persons, over all exalted, glory we offer, praise thee and adore thee now and forever. As a hymn, it's short on requests for us, which is kind of nice. Nice not to always show up as beggars asking for things, even though we are beggars who are asking for things, uh, but to show up as those who simply praise and enjoy God in his being. So that's a, that's a great hymn. 
teaches us a lot about how to be devoted to the Trinity. And then in 505, Triune God, be our stay. This is very rarely sung in congregations, which is too bad. It's really kind of interesting. Triune God, be thou our stay, O oh, let us perish never. Cleanse us from our sins, we pray, and grant us life forever. Keep us from the evil one, uphold our faith most holy, and let us trust thee solely, with humble hearts and lowly. Let us put God's armor on, with all true Christians running, our heavenly race and shining, the devil's wiles and cunning. Amen, amen, this be done, so sing we alleluia. Again, my voice, I'm, these allergies are just wreaking havoc here. But what's interesting about this is it begins, it's basically the same thing sung over and over again four times begins by addressing the Trinity first, and then addresses the same prayer to each person of the Holy Trinity, reminding us that we may pray to each person of the Holy Trinity because they are equal, um, because they are one God. The typical approach to prayer is to pray to the Father through the Son in the Spirit. But we know that we may pray to Jesus. <laughs> this happens in Scripture. Amen, come Lord Jesus. Uh, we also have... Um, Prayers for the Holy Spirit to come. We have that throughout our hymnals and throughout the history of the church. Come, holy fire, light divine, and let your word within us shine. Um, come down, O love divine. It's really another prayer to the Holy Spirit. And so by addressing these same words that I just sang uh, to each person of the Trinity, it teaches us something further about our devotion to the Trinity that we may, I mean, it's inexhaustible, our prayer. We pray to God. We pray to the three in one, we pray to the Father, we pray to Jesus, we can pray to the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't want to slip into a temptation of thinking, well, they're all just the same person who acts in different ways at different times. No, they are three distinct persons who each exist eternally, but as one being, one God. And so it's not just sort of switching off masks here. Um, God, that's an old heresy called modalism. Um, and it, what it does ultimately is it questions, it puts in doubt the eternal fellowship of love that is God from before creation, uh, extending well into the new creation. That's why we reject that. And it's not scriptural. It's not what we find in scripture. Jesus prays to the Father. He's not praying to himself and play acting, right? So there are three distinct persons, uh, but we may pray to each of them. Primacy, of course, is always given to praying to the Father. Why? Because Jesus did that. So why wouldn't we do what Jesus did? Uh, glory be to God the Father. I believe we sang this one at Zion uh, 506. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. Great Jehovah, three in one. Glory, glory, while eternal ages run. Glory comes from a Greek word, doxa, which can mean both sort of a shining and a glowing presence and also a shining good opinion or reputation. And so when we pray for glory to be given to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're praying both for his reputation to be spread abroad, for people to believe on him and trust in him. That's the glory of God. Uh, and we're also praying for his sort of shining presence to be enlarged among us, to see what we call the beatific vision, to the blessed sight of God. We, we pray to see that. This hymn, I won't go through all of it, this hymn is really kind of strong on the equality of the persons. And so it's glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Spirit. And that does have a specific verse to Jesus, which is a very common thing in hymns to the Holy Trinity, to pause and to have a specific verse about Jesus in order to confess and confirm that one member of the Holy Trinity is human. That God has welcomed our humanity into his life through Jesus, the Son. And then sort of the quintessential um, Trinity hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. This is probably something that is sung at most, if not all, Lutheran churches on Trinity Sunday. Except those that are completely divorced from 
the English uh, hymnic tradition. And it's written by Reginald Heber, who died in 1826. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I'm told that there are some churches that began every worship service with that hymn for years back, you know, decades ago, uh, because it was such a popular hymn. I am told by my mother-in-law, I believe, uh, that was one of the hymns to which they processed in, in the church where she was raised, in the churches she knew as a child, because it has a cadence for processions. The music does, holy, holy, holy. And so you would, it was a popular processional hymn at the beginning of worship. And, um, and it too is caught up, interesting, most of the prayers to the Holy Trinity, or hymns to the Holy Trinity, are caught up in just praise of him. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. This sets something to poetry, you know, makes it more beautiful to us, more memorable to us, engraves it on our heart better. Sometimes people say, why don't our children and our new generations know the faith? Have they ever learned the poetry of the faith? You know, that just, I mean, I still remember rhymes I learned as a, a child, right? Um, Mary had a little lamb, his fleece was white as snow, wherever, um, wherever Mary went, this lamb was sure to go, uh, things like that. Um, and other ones too, that were, you know, fun, fun to learn as a kid. Uh, poetry just sticks with us. And so this hymn is just sort of beautiful in its poetry, as well as the cadence of its music, uh, to engrave that praise of the Trinity within our hearts. And it relies on that triple holy, holy, holy. This is what we see in Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah has a vision of God. And what do the seraphim sing as they fly around God, veiling their eyes and hiding themselves from his glory? They sing holy, holy, holy always taken by the church as sort of a prototypical confession that there were three there, not just one. He is not holy in one person, he's holy in three persons, though there is only one holiness that they each are together. Okay, so that's just a little reflection on how to welcome the doctrine of the Trinity into devotion, to let shape not just how you think of God, but then how you relate to God and how you love him and speak to him and understand yourself really to be welcomed into his life because that's the main thing to see perhaps and it's shown to us in holy baptism and the name wrapped up around us that we are given to the father because the holy spirit unites us with the son and so even though we confess some people have said this and it's always stuck with me i think it's pretty good you know we confess the creed father son and then spirit but we really come to know the God of the creed through the spirit as he unites us with the son and brings us to the father. It kind of works backwards to how we confess it. Okay. Well, God's peace be with you this day and may the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit accompany you with his might and his peace. Blessings.